So, you have not um, shied away from controversies, but what distinguishes you is your very clear, very logical, very unexcited analysis of, of the things you are interested in, which provide a very down-to-earth, clear, structured view of the world as you see it. And as I may add, some of us here in this room probably uh, also see it similarly. By the way, some of you probably remember in the Cold War that the West Germany traded with the Soviet Union and the Americans disliked that intensely. And there was much tension between the United States and Germany, West Germany, over trading with the Soviet Union. And there was a precedent, one pipeline got blown up in the 80s by the US in Russia. Is that right? Yes. Oh, wow. So we have, it's like history repeating itself. Could we say that? What really is going on here is that the West is principally responsible for causing this war. And it's because the West was bent on turning Ukraine into a Western bulwark on Russia's border. Welcome, good evening, and uh, welcome, Professor Mearsheimer, uh, princess, prince, professors, doctors, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the free world. It's, <laughs> it's shrunk a bit, but it's still there, and as long as it's there, um, there's hope. So it's so important that we get together, exchange ideas freely, freely talk about the world freely, and uh, John Mearsheimer is certainly somebody who does so, and does so very consistently and very clearly, and is a very important voice uh, um, of sanity in an increasingly insane world. So let me tell you a bit about his distinguished career, and then uh, we'll ask him to the uh, podium. John Mearsheimer was born in Brooklyn in 1947 in New York City, and Grew up in Westchester country, just outside of New York, and uh, he earned a master's degree in international relations from the University of Southern California and a PhD in government, specifically international relations from Cornell. He lives in Chicago, and um, you have a very long Wikipedia entry, which is amazingly clear and correct, which is not the case of all Wikipedia entries speaking of experience. Um, but uh, I used the opportunity yesterday to do some personal investigations because there's little personal in your entry. So you are married, you have five children who have all made their way. You have a house, in, or you live in Chicago and you have a house in the countryside in Michigan and something that commands my utmost respect. You do 150 push-ups and 300 crunches every day. John Mearsheimer is one of the uh, leading, if not the leading proponent of the academic school of realism in international relations. And uh, I studied international relations in Princeton and uh, certainly he was a big name then. And realism um, in international politics is based on a few assumptions or a few premises, I should say, that states are the major actors, that power matters, that states compete for power and security. And, when I come, came to Princeton, you already were a big name and you wrote a very important article in the summer of 1990, which was widely discussed in our seminars. The, the article was Back to the Future, Instability in Europe after the Cold War. And you argued that instability would increase, but based on certain premises again. You've written numerous books and academic articles, as well as op-ed pieces. And You've received numerous awards, and you have been involved in a few controversies. Um, so let me just mention a few. Your first book was Conventional Deterrence in 1983. Um, then in 2001, you wrote the widely received tragedy of great power politics, which won the Le Le Lepkalt Book Prize. You wrote a book which uh, 
we're reminded of every day. The title is very pertinent. It's called Why Leaders Lie. The Truth About Lying in International Politics, 2011. And you've published widely in academic journals like International Security, but also in major newspapers like the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and Chicago Tribune. In 2007, you wrote a quite controversial book called The Israel Lobby. And US foreign policy, where you argue and you analyze the influence of the Israel lobby. And to add another personal information, you were born and raised Catholic, and uh, you are of German and Irish heritage. In, in uh, 2014, you wrote pretty quickly a very, let's say, non mainstream piece about Ukraine, and then you made a talk out of it in 2015, in September entitled, Why is Ukraine the West's Fault? The Causes and Consequences of the Ukraine Crisis. And it was done for the Alumni Club of the University of Chicago, and it has, uh, as of to date, 29,048,761 uh, views on, on YouTube and 270,617 likes. So somebody out there likes you. In October 91, you had a controversy when you were chairman of the Department of uh, um, Politics in Chicago um, regarding Elisabeth Neumann, regarding her youth, where you examined the matter because she was invited as speaker and she, of course, was a big name in Germany. Shied away from controversies, but what distinguishes you is your very clear, very logical, very unexcited analysis of, of the things you are interested in, which provide a very down-to-earth, clear, structured view of the world as you see it, and as I may add, some of us here in this room probably uh, also see it similarly. You've been a professor for over 40 years, and uh, you do enjoy teaching. You still teach a full, work, full course load at, uh, um, in Chicago, although you've did pass, let's say, 65. So um, you have a full cause load. You enjoy having a good argument. Uh, your arguments are consistent and clear. Your thoughts are consistent and clear. You're a voice of sanity. At least, I would say, most of the people in this room see it that way. Professor Mearsheimer, we're eager to hear your thoughts on Ukraine and the world at large. Please. John will talk for about 45 minutes. We'll have a short panel moderated by Yasmin Kozubek, and then we'll have a break of 10 minutes to get drinks, and then we have questions from the audience. John, welcome. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Max. Uh, thanks to Jasmine, my old friend, uh, for being the moderator this evening. And thank you all for coming out to listen to me speak. Uh, what I want to do is give a four-part talk on Ukraine, the Ukraine war. And I want to first talk about the causes of the Ukraine war. Then I want to talk about what is likely to happen on the battlefield in the conflict. In other words, who is going to win the war? Then third, I want to talk about the prospects for a peace agreement or the prospects for a diplomatic solution. And then fourth, I want to talk about the future of European-Russian relations or the future of relations between Russia and the West. And of course, that is of great relevance for Germany. So those are the four parts of, of the talk. Uh, and I won't be able to cover all the different uh, subjects that you fit under those four uh, categories. So there'll be plenty of opportunities for you folks to ask questions, and I look forward to that. OK, let me start with the causes of the war. H how did this happen? Uh, the conventional wisdom, as almost all of you know, is that it's Vladimir Putin's fault and that 
Vladimir Putin is an imperialist or an expansionist at heart. And what he wanted to do was either create a greater Russia or recreate the Soviet Union. And to do this, he had to first start by conquering and annexing Ukraine, making it part of Russia. And Ukraine was, of course, just the first target. When he was finished with Ukraine, he would go on to the Baltic states or to Poland or to Romania. This is a man who had imperial ambitions. And therefore, it's commonplace in the West to say that the attack was unprovoked. In other words, we did nothing. It was Vladimir Putin who was in the driver's seat, and he was not provoked. He started this war because he has imperial ambitions. That, of course, is the conventional wisdom. There is no evidence to support that line of evidence. I want to underline that. There is no evidence. You have to ask yourself three questions when you hear that line of argument. First of all, where does he say that that's desirable, right? That it's a desirable thing to do. Where does he say that that's a feasible thing to do? And where does he say, that's what I plan to do? And the answer is, there is no evidence that he said that this was desirable to incorporate Ukraine into Russia. There's no evidence that he said that it was feasible. And there's no evidence that he believed that this was what he was setting out to do. There's just no evidence. And here I'm talking about his intentions. But it's more than just intentions. He needs to have the capability to overrun, to conquer all of Ukraine, to occupy it, and then to annex it. He went in to Ukraine. The Russian army went into Ukraine with, at the very most, 190,000 troops. There is absolutely no way a Russian army comprised of 190,000 troops could conquer all of Ukraine. As I like to say, when the Germans went into Poland, when the Germans went into Poland on September 1st, 1939, they went in with 1.5 million men. And at the same time, the Germans were invading Poland. Two weeks later, the Red Army was coming in the back door. Still, the Germans needed 1.5 million men to take their part of Poland. The idea that 190,000 men were going to take all of Ukraine, which is a huge piece of real estate, is just not in the cards. So it's not only that Putin didn't have the intention, right? There's no evidence he had the intention. He also just didn't have the capability. And I could tell you more about how his army was configured and what that army was good for. And that army, even of 190,000 men, was not well suited for conquering territory in Ukraine. It was much more of a defensive force than it was an offensive force. So the conventional wisdom has little support, if any. What really is going on here is that the West is principally responsible for causing this war. And it's because the West was bent on turning Ukraine into a Western bulwark on Russia's border. And there were three parts to the West strategy. The first was to include Ukraine in NATO. The second was to include Ukraine in the European Union. And the third element of the strategy was to turn Ukraine into a liberal democracy that had a pro-West orientation. And of course, we talked about this as the Orange Revolution. Those were the three elements in the strategy. The most important of the three was, of course, NATO expansion. And in April of 2008, 
at the NATO summit in Bucharest, NATO said that Ukraine would become part of NATO. Putin was actually at that meeting, and Putin made it clear at the time, and Russian leaders had made it clear even before the Bucharest meeting that Ukraine in NATO, Ukraine as a Western bulwark on Russia's border was an existential threat, and they were not going to allow that to happen. Just not going to happen. There is a huge amount of evidence from 2008 up to this day that the Russians are deeply motivated by fear that Ukraine will become a Western bulwark on their border and that they have no intention of letting that happen and that Ukraine has to be a neutral state or if it's not a neutral state, it will be a dysfunctional rump state. It is just very clear uh, on uh, the evidence as to uh, why Putin invaded Ukraine on February 24th of 2022. So that's the causes. Now, the next question that I want to address is what's likely to happen on the battlefield, right? Given where we are today, who is likely to win this war? And this is one of the most difficult questions to wrestle with because the media coverage of the subject is so terrible. Uh, anything that happens on the battlefield, the West, Western media twists in ways that make it look like the Ukrainians are doing well and the Russians are doing poorly. So you don't get a very good sense of what's going on from looking at the mainstream media in the West. Uh, my basic argument is the Russians are going to win the war. Uh, and once I say that, two questions come to the fore. The first question is, what does victory mean? If I say the Russians are going to win the war, what does that mean? And then the second question that you want to ask yourself is, why is John saying that the Russians are going to win? What's the basis of his argument? Okay, so those are the two questions. Now, when I say the Russians are going to win the war, I am not saying that they are going to conquer all of Ukraine, right? They're going to conquer all of Ukraine and then cause regime change in Kyiv right, uh, so that they get a neutral government uh, and then uh, withdraw. That's, that's not going to happen. They're not going to win a decisive victory, okay? What the Russians are going to do is the Russians are going to take a huge chunk of Ukrainian territory and they're going to annex it. And furthermore, because they're not likely to get regime change and get a government that is neutral, they are going to make sure that Ukraine is a dysfunctional rump state. Dysfunctional in the sense that its economy is in constant trouble and dysfunctional in the sense that they're going to be constantly interfering in Ukraine's politics, hopefully to get regime change from their point of view. And then it's going to be a rump state because it's going to be only part of what is today or what was in 2014 Ukraine. Uh, I think it's likely that uh, the Russians will not give back Crimea or the four oblasts that they have already annexed. They've already annexed, as you know, four oblasts, uh, two of them in the Donbass, Zaporozhia, uh, and Kherson. And uh, I believe they will end up, if they can militarily, annexing four more annex, uh, four more oblasts, including uh, Odessa and Kharkiv. Uh, I'm not saying that they will do that, but I believe they will try to do that. Uh, they will concentrate on incorporating those areas 
that have lots of ethnic Russians and Russian speakers in them. And they will avoid those areas that are populated mainly by ethnic Russians. As all of you know, there was a huge conflict in the Donbass from February 2014, when the crisis first broke out, up until February 24th, 2022, when the war broke out, the war that's now going on. There was a civil war, in effect, taking place in the Donbass between the Ukrainian government and the ethnic Russians and Russian speakers in the Donbass. The Russians want to make sure that that will never happen again. And as a result, they will cleave off those areas that have lots of ethnic Russians and Russian speakers to avoid the Donbass problem. And I hate to say this, but I think there will be a significant amount of ethnic cleansing. And I believe there has already been ethnic cleansing where ethnic Ukrainians will move out of those areas that the Russians annex and ethnic Russians and Russians remaining in areas that are part of that rump Ukraine will move to the Russian areas. Uh, the hyper-nationalism that now exists in Ukraine is so powerful that it's gonna be very difficult for people who identify in any way with Russia to remain in that Ukrainian rump state. And it'd be very difficult for Ukrainian, ethnic Ukrainians to remain in that Russian annexed territory. So I just wanna be very clear here when I talk about what I mean by Russia winning the war, that I'm not talking about a decisive victory. I'm talking number one about Russia cleaving off a significant part of Ukrainian territory, and two, keeping Ukraine as a dysfunctional rump state. Now, you're saying to yourself, why do I think, why does John think that the Russians will win? This is a classic attrition war. This is like World War I. In fact, it's more like World War I than it is like World War II. And you have two armies, two large armies, standing toe to toe, beating the living daylights out of each other, uh, bleeding the other side white, or trying to bleed the other side white. There's no blitzkrieg involved here. This is not France 1940, right? This is the Western Front in World War I. And in a war of attrition, two things really matter. One is population size. How many people do you have? And basically we're talking about how many young men do you have? And number two, what does the balance of artillery look like? And the reason the balance of artillery matters is that in a war of attrition, artillery is the principal weapon on the battlefield. When I was in the army back in the day, artillery was referred to as the king of battle. Artillery really matters. If you go back and look at World War I battles, it was infantrymen who died, but they died mainly via being killed by artillery. So artillery really matters. So if you think about it, and this makes sense, in a war of attrition, how many men on one side, how many men on the other side? What's the manpower pool look like? And number two, what's the artillery balance look like? Before the war, talking about population size, Russia had a 3.5 to one advantage in population before the war, 3.5 to one. As you know, Russia has now taken a huge chunk of Ukrainian territory, right? Many Ukrainians have left to come to places like Germany, Poland, Romania, and even Russia, of course. Right. And the estimate is that 8 million Poles, excuse me, 8 million Ukrainians have left. And the population at the start of the war was around 41 million, right? 8 million have left. Uh, and the Russians, of course, have gained population. I think if you look at the population ratio now, it's probably 4.5 to 1, maybe even 5 to 1 in the Russians' favor. 
This is bad news in terms of the battlefield. Now, what about artillery? Artillery, as I said, really matters in a war of attrition. It's hard to figure out exactly what the exact ratio of artillery on the Russian side compared to the Ukrainian side looks like. The estimates are as low as five to one and as high as 10 to one. There are responsible newspapers in the West that say the Russians have an advantage of 10 to one. Others say they have an advantage of five to one. But just think about this. In a war of attrition, where one side has a five to one advantage or maybe a 10 to one advantage, that side that is on the low end of that ratio is in really deep trouble. And if you read the newspapers carefully, you can see the extent to which the Ukrainian soldiers are suffering at the hands of Russian artillery. So this is a terrible situation from a Ukrainian point of view. They don't have anywhere near as large a population as the Russians do, and they don't have the artillery. And we in the West cannot get them the artillery because our industrial base, our industrial base cannot be spun up quickly enough to get the shells and the artillery tubes to them. That's why there's all this talk about giving them tanks and martyrs. You know why they're giving them tanks and martyrs? They don't need tanks and martyrs. They need artillery pieces, and they need lots of artillery shells. They say that themselves day after day, hour after hour. That's what they need, because artillery is the king of battle. But we don't have artillery to give them in large numbers. The best we can do is maintain the five to one or 10 to one ratio, whatever it is. That's the best we can do. We cannot even out the balance of artillery. And of course, there's nothing we can do about the population imbalance. So the only hope the Ukrainians have is that they have more resolve to stay in the fight than the Russians do. But they're not gonna have more resolve. The Russians have tremendous resolve because they're facing an existential threat. And by the way, I didn't fully develop the existential threat that they're facing. It's not only that we're interested in making Ukraine a Western bulwark on their border. You understand that once the war started, we said, this is mainly the Americans, that what we're gonna do is we're gonna defeat the Ukrainian, defeat the Russian army in Ukraine. We're gonna wreck its economy we're gonna affect regime change, we're gonna put Putin on trial, and now there's even talk in the West about breaking apart Russia the way the Soviet Union broke apart in December 1991. This is a serious threat. This is an existential threat. The Russians are gonna fight like wild dogs to make sure that this doesn't happen. We're threatening the survival of this state. And when the great power's survival is threatened, you do not want to underestimate the price that they will be willing to pay to prevent that outcome. So in terms of the balance of resolve, I fully understand and I, uh, I can sympathize with the Ukrainians for wanting to win this war and to hang in there, given what's happening to their country. I understand that. But the Russians, I believe, have every bit as much resolve as the Ukrainians do. So this is the basis of my conclusion that Russia will ultimately win the war. Now, I want to talk about a third subject, uh, the prospects for a diplomatic solution or a peace agreement. Uh, you know, in the West, if you say you're in favor of diplomacy, these days, you're usually accused of being a Putin sympathizer, right? No diplomacy here. We're gonna defeat the Russians, period, end of story. No room for diplomacy. But there are lots of people out there in the land who think that there is an opportunity here. And if we can maybe get the Chinese involved or, or some other country, uh, we can uh, work out can fashion uh, a uh, peace agreement. 
that will bring a meaningful end to this fighting. That's not going to happen. It's, in my opinion, impossible. There's no way to shut this one down uh, and, and keep it shut down. The best you can hope for is a frozen conflict. That's the best you can hope for. This one is going to go on for as long as the eye can see. I'll be long gone, and this one will still be going on. Maybe not the fighting, because maybe there'll be a ceasefire, but it won't be more than a cold piece, a frozen conflict, and the threat of it starting up again will be very great. There's no deal to be had here. Now you're saying to yourself, why is John saying that? Two reasons. First of all, there's no territorial compromise, one. And number two, there is no compromise on the question of whether Ukraine is neutral or not. And let me unpack that for you, just on territory. Unsurprisingly, Ukraine wants all of its territory back. Maybe in an ideal world, the Ukrainians would be willing to give up Crimea, but they're certainly not going to be willing to give up those four oblasts that the Russians have annexed. They are now part of Russia. And the Russians have made it unequivocally clear they are not giving those oblasts back. And you can't blame the Russians any more than you can blame the Ukrainians for wanting them back. The Russians are fighting a major war. They think their survival's at stake. Those four oblasts really matter for strategic reasons, not to mention the fact that they're filled with Russians, ethnic Russians, and Russian speakers. And if the Ukrainian government, which is now on a tirade against anything Russian, gets that territory back, you've got the Donbass problem back again in spades this time. So the Russians are not going to give up the territory they've taken. And the Ukrainians are not going to be satisfied till they get that territory back. And if I'm right that the Russians are going to take more territory further to the West, they're not going to give that back, and the Ukrainians are going to want it back. How do you solve that problem? There's no solution. You can't square that circle. Then there's the question of Neutrality. The Russians do not want Ukraine to be allied with the West. Whether it's a de jure relationship with NATO or a de facto relationship with NATO, that is unacceptable. They want a neutral Ukraine. And as I said to you, if they can't get that, They'll turn it into a dysfunctional rump state that will never qualify to come into NATO or into the EU, which is what they're doing now. Well, if you're Ukraine, do you want to be neutral? You can't protect yourself. There's no question. I gave you the population figures, right? There's no way Ukraine can protect itself. If the West wasn't bankrolling Ukraine today, Ukraine would have lost long ago. Russia up against Ukraine is Bambi versus Godzilla. It's just important to understand that. It's the West that's propping up Ukraine. Uh, so Ukraine wants a security guarantee. Well, who's going to give Ukraine a security guarantee? Somebody once said to me, what about China? This is not a serious argument. China's not capable of giving Ukraine a security guarantee. Furthermore, China would be crazy to give Ukraine a security guarantee because China has its hands full dealing with the United States in East Asia. The only group of countries that can give Ukraine a security guarantee are the NATO countries, especially the United States. That's it. But the Russians are not going to accept that. And the Ukrainians want it. So how do you square that circle? And the answer is, you don't. Just two other very quick points on this. Remember, I talked about the territorial problem as an obstacle, and I talked about the neutrality problem as an obstacle. Those are the two big obstacles. There are two other obstacles. One is the hypernationalism that is now at play. 
if you read the papers over the past few weeks, the Ukrainians are going to enormous lengths to de-Russify Ukraine. It's really quite amazing what's happening here. And if you look at what the Russians are doing in the areas that they're annexing, uh, what they're doing is issuing Russian passports, asking people to use the ruble. They're making them Russian areas, right? So you have this growing hatred between the Russians and the Ukrainians, not only inside Ukraine, but pre-2014 Ukraine, but also between the two countries. This happens when major powers go to war against each other, right? Hypernationalism kicks in very quickly. But that makes it very hard to cut a deal. And furthermore, uh, there's very little trust here because Angela Merkel and President Poroshenko and uh, President Zelensky uh, and the French president, Francois Hollande, have all made it clear that they misled Putin in the negotiations on the Minsk II agreement. Putin was deeply committed to making Minsk II work. Putin did not want to have to invade Ukraine. This gets back to the first point. He had no interest whatsoever in invading Ukraine. He wanted Minsk II to work. But those other individuals who participated in the negotiations with him have now made it clear they were just stringing the Russians along so that Ukraine could build up its economy and build up its military. Angela Merkel has said she had no interest in making Minsk to work. Putin has reacted to this by making it very clear that he thinks that Merkel, that Poroshenko, Zelensky and Hollande misled him and that there is not a degree of trust left when it comes to the Russians thinking about dealing with Ukraine and the West. So there's not much trust, there's hyper-nationalism, and then you have these two big issues. You're not gonna get a meaningful peace agreement. You may get a frozen conflict, this may look like the 38th parallel in Korea, right? But uh, you're not going to shut this one down. We have really opened Pandora's box here. Come to the final subject I want to talk about, which is the future of relations between the West and Russia. These relations are poisonous. The, the Russophobia in the United States is off the charts. The Russophobia here in Europe is off the charts. The commitment to defending Ukraine here in Europe and in the United States is astounding. You know, many, many people are deeply committed to helping Ukraine and they despise Putin and they despise Russia and in a way almost Anything Russian at this point in time is despised. It's really quite remarkable. So you have these poisonous relations. Do you think they're going to go away? You think relations between Russia and Germany are going to improve over time? I don't think so. I don't think so. Because here's the problem. The West is going to remain committed to rump Ukraine. Let's assume you get a rump state. Right? And let's assume that you get a frozen conflict. The West is not going to bail out on Ukraine. We're going to continue to support Ukraine. We're going to do everything we can to support Ukraine and undermine Putin or his successor, or more generally, the Russians. The Americans are certainly going to do this. You can rest assured of that. Right? You Europeans might not be so enthusiastic about that, but the Americans will go to great lengths to cause trouble with the Russians. Right? You'll support the Ukrainians. Uh, and this will, of course, anger the Russians. And then you understand the Russians have a deep-seated interest in interfering in the politics of the West. They have a deep-seated interest 
in interfering in elections to make sure that people get elected who are sympathetic to Russia. They'll exploit the tensions between countries like Germany and Poland, Germany and France. They'll exploit tensions between the United States and Europe, and there's real potential for trouble there. Uh, let's talk a little bit about China. Uh, given that Europe is suffering because its economic ties with Russia have been cut. Europe has a deep-seated interest in making sure it has very good economic relations with China, which is very important. The Americans, on the other hand, are waging an economic war against China. You understand we're in a security competition, we mean in the United States. We're in a security competition with China. It has two dimensions. It has a military dimension, containment, and it has an economic dimension. And the economic dimension involves sophisticated or cutting edge technologies. We in the United States are scared stiff that the Chinese are gonna beat us in terms of developing sophisticated technologies, right? So what we're doing now is we're trying to reduce the inflow of technologies on the cutting edge into China. The Chinese fully understand this, and they're looking for other countries to trade with and to get sophisticated technologies or technologies that help them develop those sophisticated technologies and just help their economy grow. And they're gonna to look to Europe. And Europe is gonna to look to China because you're gonna need trade with China. China's gonna need trade with you. And that's gonna cause real tensions between the United States and Europe. And as you know already, the United States has not been hurt very much by this war compared to how badly Europe and countries like Germany have been hurt by this war. And in a world where the United States is telling you, you should curtail your trade with China, that's not gonna make you very happy, right? But this is just another opportunity for the Russians to exploit these cleavages that exist. Just one final point on this. A lot of people think it's wonderful that Finland and uh, Sweden have joined NATO. I think this is the wrong way to think about this. The Russians already feel like they're being encircled by NATO. The Russians will tell you, just look at a map of Europe today. Look at all the countries that belong to NATO and look at how close they are to us. So let's add two more, Finland and Sweden. And then let's look at the Baltic Sea. And you know the Russians care very much about the Baltic Sea, especially because of Kaliningrad, right? they care. The Baltic Sea is surrounded by NATO countries now that Finland and Sweden are in. Just take a look at a map sometime. And then even more importantly, there's the Arctic. All that ice is melting. That's opening up all sorts of economic opportunities in the Arctic, and it's presenting strategic problems. There are eight countries, eight countries that are geographically located in the Arctic, Seven of them now belong to NATO. One, the other one, Russia. One versus seven. And you know, by the way, the Russians are now approaching the Chinese about getting the Chinese to work with them in the Arctic. And the Chinese, of course, are very willing to do this. Right? But the other way of thinking about this is the Russians are outnumbered seven to one. So if a dispute comes up in the Arctic, Crisis breaks out in the Arctic, and they're outnumbered seven to one. And most of their conventional forces are in Europe, in Ukraine. I think what they're gonna do is rely more on nuclear weapons up there, right? Uh, so you just wanna remember, when you're dealing with a great power like Russia, and you threaten its survival, you're pushing that great power into a situation where it's gonna pursue risky strategies. And this is a great power that has thousands of nuclear warheads aimed at us. 
And the idea that you can back them into a corner and you can threaten to push them off a cliff is for me an incredibly foolish way to think about doing business. And I'll just tell you one quick story. Uh, the best example to highlight this is uh, the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor against the United States, December 1941. When I was growing up, I, I thought, as most people did, that the Japanese were irrational, that they were crazy. Uh, why would they dare attack the United States? You know, the United States had 10 times the gross national product of Japan. 10 times the gross national product. And furthermore, the Japanese were heavily dependent on imports of scrap iron and oil from the United States. Well, I've now learned over the, you know, the past 20 years that the Japanese policymakers were first class strategists, they were very rational, and they understood clearly what they were doing. And what happened there is that the United States was strangling Japan. The United States was strangling Japan. In the summer of 1940, we cut off scrap iron supplies to Japan, and this really mattered. And then in July of 1941, we cut off, scrap, uh, we cut off oil supplies to Japan, and that really mattered. What we were doing was we were strangling their economy the way the West wants to strangle the Russian economy but has been unable to do. The United States was able to strangle the Japanese economy. And the Japanese tried to wiggle off the hook. The Japanese tried to work out a diplomatic agreement with the United States, but Roosevelt would not play. He wouldn't give them a moment to talk about the issue. He just, Roosevelt was not playing. He just kept squeezing. And the Japanese attacked at Pearl Harbor because they were desperate. They thought that they were gonna be knocked out of the ranks of the great powers. Their economy was gonna be destroyed. They had to do something to rescue the situation. And even though they understood there was only a sliver of a chance that they would succeed, there was only a sliver of a chance of a chance they would succeed in their own minds. They nevertheless attacked at Pearl Harbor. Why? Because they were desperate and they were willing to pursue an extremely risky policy. So again, what you want to understand with the Russians is that if you push them too far, right, they will pursue a risky foreign policy. And I think up in the Arctic, in Ukraine, uh, these are very dangerous situations. Let me conclude with one final point. I think that if there had been no decision in April of 2008 to expand NATO eastward to include Ukraine, there would have been no war. If Angela Merkel had prevailed at Bucharest in April 2008, I believe that Ukraine would be intact today to include Crimea. Right? And furthermore, I believe that German-Russian relations would be excellent. There would be no war. All of this is to say one cannot one cannot underestimate the foolishness of the policy that we have pursued, mainly with the United States in the driver's seat since April 2008. And when you think about where this is headed, where it is at the moment and where it's headed, it is a cause for great depression. Thank you. Mr. Otto, I actually have a first question for you. Um, you've made it quite clear that you agree with most of the things that Mearsheimer is presenting here. And I'd really like to know what you disagree with, because I'm sure there's something. Okay, well, I'm not quite as hopeful as John. So I, I'm, I'm more pessimistic. 
So I, I think this has the potential to spiral out of uh, control a bit more. I mean, you believe uh, that rationality will prevail when I see some of the uh, current leaders and their actions um, is very reassuring, but I don't share it 100%. Would you agree? Because it, it doesn't sound too hopeful to me, what you just presented. You, know, you said there's no way out. Well, I would ask Max, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, are you fearful of nuclear escalation? Uh, I mean, what, what? Yeah, I still think that uh, maybe NATO will get involved. That's my greatest anxiety um, on the ground or in whichever way. Um, that uh, if, I, if I listen to the talk, that does not seem to be out of the question. Yeah, let, let me make two points just on, on the escalation issue. First of all, I think if the Russians were to lose or to start losing, I believe they would use nuclear weapons to rescue the situation, okay? So what that means is that the West's policy of defeating Russia inside of Ukraine makes the likelihood of nuclear war go up, if it works. In other words, if the West succeeds, if German policy succeeds in Ukraine, you make the risk of nuclear war go up. It's very important to understand that. The reason I didn't pay much attention to nuclear escalation in my comments, as Max is pointing out, is because I think the Russians are in the driver's seat now, and the Russians uh, will ultimately win the war, and therefore nuclear weapons will not be used. Uh, but with regard to the United, with regard to the United States coming into the war, if I'm right and the Russians are winning, there'll be a very serious temptation for the United States to come in. That's where the great power war comes, and. I cannot rule that out any more than you can rule out nuclear war in this case. So we are in a really dangerous situation for sure. So, um, Otte, you've actually, uh, Mr. Otte, you've actually painted or sort of uh, three scenarios in your book, right? Weltsystem crash, mm -hmm. and I'm surprised that you have such a such a poor outlook on the future because the the full-scale war, you, you didn't say it was the most likely scenario. The most likely scenario, um, you said, would be something like a new Cold War, right? Um, with the highest probability, you'd have two dominant blocs, US and China, and India and Russia, the status uh, would be open, right? So do you still consider that to be the highest probability? I, I wrote about three scenarios in 19. Um, the new Cold War, Chinese bloc, I mean, it's totally in line with John's uh, thinking and, and arguments, uh, a Chinese bloc, a US-dominated Western bloc with a more integration of Europe into the US sphere of influence. And I, at that point, I said the status of Russia is open because it could be either in the Western or in the Chinese bloc. This is just four years ago. Uh, and that was my most likely, not my most desired scenario. And my least likely and most desired scenario was a multipolar world with a strong Europe. But I, even then I said, that's very unlikely. And um, I, I think John would completely agree, or would you? But you know what I, I would like to add to that? Um, you have something in common with Chancellor Schultz. <laughs> he actually, well, maybe just the word, um, he actually just recently um, in a speech in front of the EU parliament spoke about the world being a multipolar world. So I found this very interesting to, for him to use this word. Am I giving it too much weight, even like talking about it? Or how would he even define a multipolar world, our chancellor? Well, I think uh, multipolar today means China, Russia, and the United States. And there are still some people who think the United States is so powerful we live in a unipolar world and some other people who think that Russia really doesn't count as a great power, especially if you look at its rather poor military performance so far uh, in Eastern Ukraine, and therefore it's a bipolar world. But I think most people believe that we live in a multipolar world. And this is wonderful news for the Russians and the Chinese. 
The Russians and the Chinese love to hear people talk about living in a multipolar world. Usually, you would expect a German chancellor to say that he or she likes the unipolar world because the unipolar world is dominated by the United States. And as you all know, Germans love the idea of being dominated by the United States. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, so so uni unipolarity is a good thing. And by the way, if we were truly in a unipolar world, we wouldn't have this conflict with the Russians, right? It was the fact that the unipolar world came to an end. And the same thing is true with China, right? It, until China rose and we moved into a multipolar world, there was no US-China competition. You want to think, by the way, just parenthetically, a, a lot of people in the West or in the United States will say that China is a threat because it's a communist state. This is communism versus liberal democracy. That's the China-US uh, competition. My response to that is China was a communist state during the 1990s. It was a communist state up until 2017, right? And we got along perfectly well with the Chinese. There were no problems at all. What changed was the balance of power. China became really rich, began to translate its economic might into military might, and that is why you moved into a multipolar world. But we now would prefer a unipolar world where China's down here and we're up there. But those days are gone. Maybe we can speak about China for a moment. Um, I think you just introduced the topic really well. And um, I think uh, the, the China and German relations, you know, they're, they're going. They've been seeing each other quite, uh, quite a lot the past couple of months. I think there were three visits um, between Foreign Minister Baerbock and the Foreign Minister um, of China. And um, China, don't, they don't like to talk about a war in Ukraine. They like to talk about a crisis. But you see them seeing each other over and over again. So what does that tell us? What does that tell us? What is Germany trying to do? What is our foreign minister trying to do? Um, trying to convince China to negotiate with Russia or trying to actually keep China from closer relations to Russia? What is happening? Well, as I said, I think once Germany loses Russia, as a trading partner, it makes it more important than ever for Germany to trade with China. And the same thing is true with the French. Macron was over in China as well, and Macron was playing nice with China. And the reason Macron was playing nice with China is he wants to trade with China. By the way, some of you probably remember in the Cold War that the West Germany traded with the Soviet Union, and the Americans disliked that intensely. And there was much tension between the United States and Germany, West Germany, over trading with the Soviet Union. And there was a precedent. One pipeline got blown up in the 80s by the US in Russia. Is that right? Yes. Oh, wow. So we have... It's like history repeating itself. Could we say that? You know, you just mentioned Nord Stream 2. I find that so interesting. So what is your opinion on that? I would like to hear what you have to say about that. Well, I think it's clear the Russians did not blow up Nord Stream. <laughs> <laughs> it's clear the Germans did not blow up Nord Stream. Uh, and I think it really sort of comes down to whether you believe the Americans did it or whether the Ukrainians and the Poles did it. My view is that Seymour Hersh is right and that the Americans did it. Uh, the Americans effectively mm -hmm. said they were going to do it. Uh, numerous American policymakers, including the president, effectively said they were going to do it. There was great pleasure in the United States when it was done. Um, and the former foreign <laughs> minister of Poland uh, thanked the United States immediately after it was done. Uh, uh, Mr. Sikorsky. So I think there's a lot of evidence that it was the Americans who did it. And, uh, and by the way, I think the fact that the German media is not paying any attention or hardly any attention to this issue, and the German government is paying hardly any attention to this issue, is because they don't want to discuss 
they don't want to have to reveal that the result of their investigation is that the United States did it, because that would do enormous damage to America's position in Europe in general, and in Germany in particular. What is your opinion on it? Why do you think that the media doesn't care or the politicians aren't trying to figure out? Do you think it could actually have dismal and a dismal effect on German and US relations, even if it were to come out that the US did it? It would have a significant effect, I mean, because right now there's really a matrix. I mean, we don't hear much in mainstream media. And I mean, Axel Springer got bought up by a US private equity just a few years ago. And uh, Spiegel and Die Zeit get grants from the US, from the Gates Foundation. You can look it up in, in the foundation report. So there's quite, and then there's, of course, the uh, transatlantic media connections um, that up to seven, eight years ago, you could talk about openly also in, in talk shows, but you can't anymore. So it's really, um, it's really a, a, a very much voicing US positions. And as Robert Habeck, the greatest economics minister of all times, um, <laughs> said he, he wanted to be in a serving leadership role. Serving what? Serving whom? Certainly not Germany. Um, so, um, yes, I, I mean, public opinion right now is polarized, which is happening often in times like this when people do not know what to think. You, you get, give them simple explanations, you give them a scape, scapegoat. Uh, Putin is a scapegoat. We've heard a more complex explanation from John. But this issue would have the potential of, of breaking that matrix. But it's, right now it's not happening because <laughs> There's very strong interests to keep it under cover. And there's just a, a few of us who say it openly, but we don't get much uh, distribution in the media or none at all. And we're, we're being de denounced. Mm -hmm. Doesn't sound very hopeful. Um, uh, John, I, really, I just have a really clear cut question for you right now. I really would like to know what you think of our foreign minister, uh, Minister Annalena Baerbock. I'd just like to know. I'm, I'm going to plead the Fifth Amendment. No, I don't think, you know, we're not in the United States, so you can't plead the Fifth over here. Well, well you know, Americans uh, apply their law exterritorially, so... Uh, Very true. <laughs> I know because I pay American taxes, of course, as an American citizen, but... <laughs> well, maybe you could give us a diplomatic answer, just from your point of view as a political I, I th science I think the foreign expert. minister's views on the Ukraine war are completely misguided. And I think that they are making a bad situation worse. Uh, and uh, I think when you look at German leadership today and you compare it to German leadership during the Cold War, it's like night and day. Uh, I think that during the Cold War and, and even uh, in, in much of the unipolar moment, the post-Cold War what? period up to 2017. What about U.S. leadership then? No, I think that U.S. leadership has oftentimes been terrible. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I'm not arguing that the Biden administration uh, has a smart policy on Ukraine for one second. Uh, the Biden administration's policy is misguided. You want to remember that Joe Biden handled the Ukraine portfolio in the Obama administration. When Joe Biden was the vice president, uh, he was tasked with handling Ukraine. And he was known in the administration after 2014, when the crisis broke out, as a super hawk on, uh, on Ukraine. So it's no accident that when he moved into the White House in January 2021, 2021, that's when he moves in, over the course of that year, 2021, the crisis escalated and then the war broke out in early 2022, a little bit after a year that he had moved into the White House. And it's because Biden was tightening the screws on the Russians with regard to Ukraine. We were going to greater lengths under Biden than we had under Trump to bring Ukraine into NATO to make it, at that time, a de facto member of NATO. This was 
in my opinion, a remarkably foolish policy. So when you talk about Baerbach and her views, I have little use for them, but I have little use for Joe Biden's views or Anthony Blinken's views or Jake Sullivan's views. I think all of these individuals have been pushing the West to pursue a foreign policy that has blown up in our face. And as I tried to make clear in my formal comments, is going to linger for a long time and cause all sorts of problems here in Europe, cause all sorts of problems in Russia, and most of all in Ukraine. What has happened to Ukraine is an unmitigated disaster. There's no hope of repairing this situation in any meaningful way for the Ukrainians. Uh, so uh, I just think that all of these policymakers uh, made an egregious error. Mm -hmm. um, I have a follow-up question on that. There's a presidential campaign or election coming up, 2024, in the United States. And I think one of the favorable candidates, um, Mr. Donald Trump, I mean, he's in the runs again. And he just said a couple of days ago at a CNN town hall that he would be able to shut down Ukraine, you know, the crisis in a day. What do you think about that? Well, he's, he's not going to do that. I mean, just two points to be made. As I said to you here, there's no way to shut this one down because there's no deal to be had. There's just no deal. The second point is both Barack Obama in 2008 and Donald Trump in 2016 were elected on the platform that they were going to fundamentally alter American foreign policy. You remember when Donald Trump was first elected, he was going to have or establish good relations with the Russians. He was going to end NATO. He was going to get the Americans out of Europe. Uh, and so forth and so on. He didn't do that. In, in fact, NATO survived Donald Trump. U.S.-Russian relations under Donald Trump got worse. Donald Trump was the president who in 2017 decided to start arming the Ukrainians. Obama wouldn't arm the Ukrainians. It was Donald Trump who did. What happened here, and this is what happened to Obama as well, and Obama said this, is that the foreign policy establishment, or what we call the blob in the United States, beat Obama down and they beat Trump down. So if Trump gets elected, the idea that he will be an independent force who can alter American foreign policy by himself is delusional. He's not going to do that. He has to work with the deep state. He has to work with all of these other interest groups and other elites in the United States who will go to great lengths to make sure we, we remain deeply committed to the status quo. And by the way, the same thing is true with Republicans versus Democrats. A number of Republicans have said that we're not going to continue to support Ukraine forever. And they have made it appear like we will bail out, we will abandon Ukraine. But if you look carefully, they're small in number. Many of them have walked back their comments. DeSantis, for example, has now said that he's a staunch supporter of Ukraine. So the Republicans and the Democrats are both behind supporting Ukraine for the foreseeable future. And Donald Trump can say what he wants in the campaign, but once he's sitting in the White House, assuming he gets elected, he'll support the status quo. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I'd like to uh, pose a question to you, uh, Mr. Otte. Um, I read some of your dissertation that you published, I think it was done in around the 2000s, right? <laughs> It was written in 96 and published in 2000. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting for me to you know, understand how post um, DDR or after the unification process in Germany, how Germany actually established itself like in the international order. And there was one sentence that stuck out to me. I already told you. Um, and you wrote, it is our prediction that Germany will continue to remain a force of the status quo for a long time to come. Now, granted, you wrote this 20 years ago. 
But I really wanted to ask you what you thought about that today and what you thought about Germ uh, the, the, what you think about Germany's force or role today and if it's still a force of status quo. It remained a force of the status quo because um, um, it's a middle power and the, the, the thesis was that middle powers try to balance and to be good neighbors and to be friendly and then so it, use influence that way. Uh, of course, there was NATO, we didn't have nuclear arms. And so that was the basic argument that Germany would basically, because there was fear in the US in the early 90s that the US, uh, Germany would aspire to get nuclear arms, that it would become um, more aggressive and so on and so forth. There was a huge debate. So our, my prediction was it would stay uh, a middle power, int uh, intent on maintaining good relations and all these things. And it has done so, it has done so. And, uh, but for the past couple of years, of course, we have seen a world system really upside down in turmoil. I mean, there's still the, the Western bloc, the Western alliance, there's China, there's Russia, uh, the status of which was undetermined just a few years ago. I mean, we could see where it was tipping. It was, um, we were alienating it, but uh, um, maybe this is a backdoor comment on our foreign minister, but uh, um, Germany does not have much of an independent foreign policy left. I mean, there is, we see it with the energy policy lobbies, foreign lobbies. I mean, foreign lobbying in the US is a, is a cardinal sin. But uh, in Germany, foreign lobbying is, is ever present. And so there's not much of an apparatus that formulates and does anything like a national strategy. So. Yes, we've been a power of the status quo, but right now we're, let's say, just more or less a territory with no, that is being manipulated uh, with no, not much of an independent policy. I mean, it's basically following the US lead. Uh, John has talked about that we like, like to do that. And so um, we're in a situation where we're not sure what the status quo really is, but for a long time it has been a power of the status quo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you see, what role would you see that Germany could play in the foreseeable future? And maybe I'd like to elaborate on that question because you did say that um, Merkel, Angela Merkel, did not support the Bucharest um, initiative to include Ukraine into NATO 2008. And then you said that she also wasn't, um, how do you say, she wasn't, um, she didn't pursue Minsk or she didn't make Ukraine pursue Minsk. So that to me seems a little bit contradictory, right? She knew that it would cause harm, right, to follow the strategy of including Ukraine into NATO. But then again, she didn't really try to make Ukraine follow Minsk. So how does that go together? It's hard to say. Uh, I mean, the Minsk process started after the conflict broke out in 2014. And after that, the nature of the situation involving Ukraine changed. In other words, in 2008, when Merkel was opposed to NATO expansion, the issue was just on the table. There had been no decision made. So it was a prime opportunity for her to oppose bringing Ukraine into NATO, and she did. The problem is that she caved in, right? Then with regard to Minsk, right, you had the conflict already starting, and she just, I guess, felt that, uh, uh, that it was appropriate or important to let Ukraine get more powerful to string the Russians along and let Ukraine get more powerful. Uh, but uh, I mean, I, I'm not you know, privy to her deep thoughts about why to do this, uh, but I think it was just two different situations. Maybe you have a slightly different view as a, let's play amateur psychologist, but probably she did actually believe in Minsk too. And now that she's seeing that the tide has turned, she wants to get on the right side of, of the argument. So I, that would be more like her, I would think so. That would eliminate the contradiction that uh, Jasmine pointed out. Uh, perhaps. Perhaps. And just a quick one. 
Do you think Germany could at all play a significant, significant role, maybe with a different leadership, who knows, um, to maybe help improve the situation with Ukraine and then therefore also with Russia? See, the reason I'm so pessimistic is I don't think if you put me in charge of German foreign policy that I could do much to fix the situation. Uh, what I tried to convey here tonight is that we have got ourselves into a situation where there is no solution. It, it, it's not like you need to you know, bring back Otto von Bismarck from the dead and put him in the chancellor's office and he can then figure out how to get out of this. It, it, there's just no real solution that's available. Because of the problems that I explained to you, the Russians don't want to give up that territory. Uh, the Ukrainians want it back. Uh, the whole neutrality issue, you know, Ukraine wants a security guarantee. I mean, I just don't see how you solve those problems. And so many people have now died. And the relations between the West and the East are so poisonous. Uh, I mean, I just don't see how you repair all these things anytime soon. Uh, so, so no, no optimism. So I, yeah, I, look, maybe I'm wrong. I, I've been in this business for a long time, and I understand that you know we're trying to predict what the future looks like, and prediction is a really tricky business. And there is some chance that I'll be wrong. Let's hope that I'm wrong. Let's hope that this situation changes drastically over the course of the next couple of years, and I have egg all over my face. I would be happy if that proved to be the case. But I just, you know, when I look at the available evidence and I think about it in a logical fashion, it looks uh, pretty grim to me uh, moving forward. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that, John. And I'm not going to, yes, we're going to take a break now. I'm not going to ask you for an optimistic outlook into the future. I already know you're a bit pessimistic, but we are going to take a break, um, a 10-minute break for drinks and maybe, you know, um, just to, to take a breather. And then we'll come back with a QA, and a and you guys will have the opportunity to ask questions. So I think I'm sure we'll have some interesting things to talk about. So, yes, let's break. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 